Good afternoon or good morning from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar will focus on the impacts of melting glaciers on nutrient supply in coastal ecosystems of the northern Gulf of Alaska. Our speaker today is Dr. John Cruzius. John received a BA in chemistry from Carleton College and a PhD in geochemistry from Columbia University and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. John did postdoctoral work at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and worked for a while as a research scientist at the International Atomic Energy Agency Marine Environment Lab in uh, Monaco. From 2003 to 2011, John was a research scientist in Woods Hole at the USGS Coastal and Marine Geology Center. And since 2011, John has remained a USGS research scientist with the Coastal Marine Geology Program, but he is based in Seattle at the University of Washington, where he has an affiliate faculty position in the School of Oceanography. John is married and has one son in high school. Well, John, that's quite the, quite the experience. Um, everyone, please welcome John, um, and you may begin. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ashley, and thanks for your help setting up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, Yes, today I'd like to speak on impacts of melting glaciers on nutrient supply and coastal ecosystems of the northern Gulf of Alaska. I want to acknowledge a lot of collaborators who did a lot of this work. I'm going to give a broad overview. Um, I've listed a lot of people here. I don't have time to acknowledge them all individually. And in particular, I want to acknowledge um, funding from the USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. <clears throat> excuse me, from the Coastal Marine Geology Program and from the Mendenhall Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. I'm going to speak briefly on um, some, some NASA-funded work of ours that is relevant to the overall project. Okay, um, here's an outline of what I want to present today. Th this is a challenging talk because this is a large multi-investigator study and I'm trying to uh, summarize what a lot of people did um, in 45 minutes, and pretty much every slide I present could be expanded into a 45-minute talk. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, um, and I'm also going to try to keep it accessible to a fairly general audience um, while maintaining the scientific integrity. So uh, please bear with me. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep you with me as I go. So just to give you a, an, an outline, um, I'm going to speak briefly on the evidence for glacier mass loss from the northern Gulf of Alaska in particular. I'm going to examine the marine food web foundations, including nutrients, nitrate, and iron, which limit phytoplankton growth. I hope I will convince you that glaciers are a source of iron, which is a, nu a nutrient uh, that limits phytoplankton growth, and that rivers and sediment resuspension and dust are all important sources of the micronutrient iron. I'm going to discuss some seasonal variability in the nutrient sources and allude to the fact that there's hyperactivity in the spring along the continental shelf transect that we studied in response to this high nutrient supply. By late summer, nitrate is limiting, the limiting nutrient. Zooplankton and fish abundance tend to be high in the river plume that we studied, the Copper River plume, for reasons of predator evasion. And then I'm going to end with some model simulations of Copper River discharge in the Gulf of Alaska, including some uh, simulations of two times present discharge and discuss some impacts of, of that. All right, so here is a, some results from a recent paper from um, the journal Nature showing evidence for glacier mass loss worldwide, although I'm focusing strictly on the, on the northern Gulf of Alaska area glaciers. Here's a map of North America that you'll all recognize, and here's Alaska. You see this southern Alaska 
region at the northern end of what we refer to as the Gulf of Alaska, this being the Gulf of Alaska, right where the number 12 is, um, these, this area is, is lined by many mountain glaciers. And there's a paper, this paper that I mentioned in Nature, which documented mass loss of these glaciers over the time period 2003 to 2011 using the GRACE uh, satellite. Um, what you see here from 2003 to 2011 is mass increasing in the winter, decreasing in the summer, and that cycle repeating over and over again. But there's a general downward trend that's uh, pretty much indisputable um, over that time frame. Now, there have been a lot of high-profile papers on this general topic in recent years, and I could have picked any, any number of them. I picked this one mainly because it's quite recent. Um, it was in the journal Nature, and it actually shows data from this uh, southern Alaska region. Okay, some work that is relevant that was done by uh, one of our USGS team members uh, I'm presenting here. This is a work done on the Bering Glacier from 2002 to 2012. Now, our project really included field work only from 2010 and 2011, so this represents a whole lot of extra effort by um, the lead author, Ed Josberger. This is uh, work from the Bering Glacier at the northern end of the Gulf of Alaska. It's just a little bit east of the Copper River. Um, for those of you who know where that is, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and this is a little bit different from the last paper I alluded to. This is documenting summer melt as a function of time from 2002 to 2012, and it teases apart the con contributions to that melt of ice melt, snow melt, and precipitation. And what's striking, uh, to me anyway, is uh, that there's surprisingly little variability during this 10-year time frame. Fairly steady melt of 40 plus or minus 3 kilometers cubic kilometers per year, um, a little bit of up and down as time goes on, but not a, not a really noticeable temporal trend showing an increase over time. Um, this plot, this, this um, line with the diamonds connecting, it shows melt degree days, a measure of uh, the warmth essentially during the summer melt period. And sure enough, during warmer periods, as you might expect, there's more melt and less melt during um, colder days, but there is not an overall trend. Uh, now, I want to just emphasize that this is not really in conflict with the previous slide because this is only showing the summer melt. This is not looking at the annual mass balance. Um, but interestingly, over this 10-year time period, there's not um, an increase in, in melt over time. I'm going to come back to this, uh, this analysis of what might happen in the future a little bit later. Okay, now this is a map, obviously, of um, North America primarily, and here is the Gulf of Alaska area. Here is this coastal Gulf of Alaska area, and what I want to point out simply is that this, this area, which is not that well known to most people living in the lower 48 states, um, despite being fairly far removed from, from large population centers, it's actually uh, an area that receives a tremendous amount of river discharge. And just to give you a number, uh, these coastal Gulf of Alaska rivers discharge about 870 kilometers, cubic kilometers per year. Uh, contrast that with the Mississippi River, a much better known river, um, which discharges 530 kilometers, cubic kilometers per year. And the Columbia and the Yukon, you know, around 200 cubic kilometers per year. So despite the fact that these Gulf of Alaska rivers are relatively obscure to most people, they discharge a heck of a lot of water, and that's because there's a lot of precipitation in this region. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the main reason. Primarily, there's a lot of precipitation, and it all, you know, much of that drains off into the Gulf of Alaska. Another reason this area is of interest scientifically is that the Gulf of Alaska, again, this, this region to the south of Alaska, is referred to as an iron-limited ecosystem. Now, that means that iron um, is a nutrient that limits the growth of phytoplankton, essentially the base of the marine food web, um, because of its relative scarcity. And what I'm showing here in this plot is a global map of nitrate concentrations 
and what you see is that the nitrate concentrations in this Gulf of Alaska region are fairly high. That's for a couple of reasons, really. It's, it's partly because that's at the end of uh, what's kind of uh, casually referred to as the global conveyor belt, the, the meridional overturning circulation that leads to upwelling of deep water in this North Pacific region. So there's, you know, it's kind of the end of the line in terms of oceanographic circulation. But in addition, um, phytoplankton growth is iron limited because of uh, distance from iron sources in this region. Um, so that is another thing that makes it somewhat unusual um, relative to the rest of the ocean where nitrate is more typically the, the limiting nutrient. Okay, we know that iron is a limiting nutrient, but we don't know very much about the processes that transport iron to the iron limited regions of the Gulf of Alaska. And some of this work is going to shed some light on some of those processes. This is just a two-dimensional schematic that doesn't really do justice to everything, and I just want to point out this does not show uh, eddies, which are uh, uh, a phenomenon that can transport iron from the coast into the open ocean. But uh, I'm going to focus on riverine inputs, on dust inputs, on some, some iron inputs from this continental shelf region. And all of these end up being sources of iron that fuel high plankton productivity in this shelf region. All right, another thing that makes this part of the world interesting, this is again uh, showing the southern Alaska region in the coastal area just south of that glacier dominated area I, I referred to. This is a plot of chlorophyll concentration, and you see this high chlorophyll concentration in this coastal area. Some work by Ware and Thompson and Science 2005 showed that um, a relationship, they showed a relationship between the mean chlorophyll concentration and the mean resident fish yield, which they uh, interpreted to, to mean that this ecosystem was controlled from the bottom up, in other words, from the base of the food web up, and phytoplankton being the base of the food web. Um, so we, one of the questions we posed was whether this ecosystem of the Copper River uh, plume region, and that, just for your reference, is right around here in this plot, is also um, controlled in, in a similar kind of bottom-up bottom, bottom up ecosystem fashion. All right, so why, why the Copper River? We're, we're going to focus on the Copper River, which is one of these rivers that drains into the Gulf of Alaska. First of all, it's a site of important fisheries. It's the single largest, largest freshwater source to the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, a significant portion of the Copper River watershed is glacier covered, and that has implications for the nutrient cycling and nutrient inputs to the ocean. Also, prior to this work, there were little or no iron data and few oceanographic observations from the vicinity. And finally, a more general justification is that river plumes uh, in other words, the plume of water that extends out into the ocean from the river can serve as protection for various organisms from predators. All right, this is a plot of Copper River discharge um, from the Million Dollar Bridge Station, uh, not too far from where it discharges into the ocean, and uh, a bit of an unusual um, uh, representation of time, but the main point to make here is that I guess there are a couple of main points. First of all, discharge increases dramatically in this April-May time frame. Discharge reaches a peak in July-August, and it's still fairly high in the fall um, in response to various floods. This, this pattern of discharge is typical. This is an average um, discharge from the Copper River. It's typical for this, this region. It's quite atypical for probably most of the rivers that you, most of you who are listening are, are familiar with. Um, the reason the discharge peaks in the, in the summer is not that that's when all the precipitation happens. It's because that's when all the snow and ice melt happens. So you get this massive discharge peak in um, July and August. In the winter, from roughly November to March or so, there's very little discharge. Uh, again, there's plenty of precipitation. This is not evidence of lack of precipitation at that time. It's just that the precipitation is freezing and uh, not going out the river. So the, this timing is quite different um, from rivers that many of you might be familiar, familiar with, but it has implications for the, the timing of the nutrient inputs into the ocean in this part of the world. So one of the first questions we posed 
was uh, how will the flux and distribution of riverine iron delivered to the Gulf of Alaska change due to warming climate and retreating glaciers. So first of all, let's just um, get oriented here. We're going to show some uh, some data from the a series of tributaries from the Copper River watershed. Now here's Alaska. Here, this outline in orange is the Copper River watershed. And I'm going to show data from a set of tributaries. This is this is work that was carried out um, virtually entirely by Andrew Schroth as part of his Mendenhall postdoctoral program um, when he was at Woods Hole. Um, so I want to show out, so this is the Copper River watershed. I'm going to show data from a few different river types, um, but the two main points I want to make are that there are these glacier-dominated rivers. Those of you who have seen glacier-dominated rivers have probably seen this type of murky water before. This is murky gray water. It's murky and gray because there's a lot of fine particulate matter in it that results from weathering from these glaciers. That's that's one river type. Whenever the the river drains uh, what we call a glacierized river valley, this is typically what you see, very murky water. The other uh, river type is this boreal lowland black water uh, river type. This is a a river that drains water that's uh, much lower elevation, no glaciers, but very peaty, very, um, it's a region that's full of peatlands, uh, wetlands, and as a consequence, the water gets very brown because it has high concentrations of organic acids, high dissolved organic matter concentrations. So this is actually a, a, a photo that shows these two river types mixing together um, when they when they flow into each other. Um, just show to show those two river types in one photo. I'm going to show how each of these manifests itself in terms of impacts on iron in just a minute. Okay, here's a picture of the, again, the Copper River watershed. These dots represent different tributaries of the Copper River. Um, here's Andrew uh, showing off his clean, trace metal clean river sampling strategy. We always get a lot of laughs when we show this image of him in the, in the truck. We need to get a different image for that. But that shows the clean, trace metal clean river sampling. I'm going to mention some different size fractions of iron. Particulate iron is larger than 0.45 micron. Colloidal iron is smaller than 0.45 micron, but larger than 0.02 micron. And dissolved is less than 0.02 micron. Um, this has implications for the fate of that iron as it goes into the ocean, which I'll get to in a minute. All right, so these different tributary types uh, have different characteristics. The glacierized uh, tributaries, so let me back up. I'm plotting colloidal iron. So this is, you can think of it as small particles, concentration of small particles of iron versus dissolved iron. This is stuff that passes through a very fine filter, and it's truly, truly in solution, truly dissolved. So these two different river types have very different iron types. There's the, the largely particulate iron that's common in these glacierized watersheds, and a largely dissolved iron in these wetland-dominated rivers. Um, you can see that in a different way when you plot colloidal iron versus colloidal silica. Essentially, the glacierized Glacier-dominated rivers have both fine particulate iron and fine particulate silica because it's essentially part ground-up rock. There's ground-up rock that is giving it that milky gray color. That's a source of iron. It's also a source of uh, dissolved silica versus the boreal forested uh, rivers, which show uh, much lower dissolved silica concentration and, and um, typically smaller concentrations of, of iron as well. Okay, so Andrew uh, did a, some time series river sampling that I don't have time to show, but I just want to acknowledge that that work is a big part of this project as well. I'm going to jump ahead to some work that Andrew and I did at the mouth of the Copper River. Here is the uh, satellite image of the Copper River, and you see this muddy river plume extending into the ocean. Um, on the right is actually a close-up of, of that taken with an actual camera. And so on the left is this uh, 
muddy river plume, fresh water. On the right is, is seawater, and this front occurs over a space of centimeters, really. It's really dramatic. So what is known from the iron literature is that iron, dissolved iron, tends to be removed in estuaries. Now, the estuary of the Copper River is quite different from what most of you might be familiar with when you think of an estuary. Um, the Copper River is more this abrupt front from fresh to salt rather than a gradual mixing of the two. We did our best to try to sample across this front, and um, I'm going to focus first on this plot on the lower right where I'm plotting dissolved iron versus salinity. And the dissolved iron concentrations at low salinity are quite high. That's because of this freshwater input in the ocean. At high salinity, they're low because that iron is, is getting diluted from with iron-poor seawater. Um, if you had mixing of fresh water with saline with seawater with no iron removal, the, the data points would fall on a line looking something like this for my, you know, pretty much a straight line. Instead, what you see is this pronounced curve where there's the iron concentration has dropped dramatically as you go into the salt water, and then they stay fairly low. Um, that shape is characteristic of, of dissolved iron removal. What happens is the organic iron complex uh, readily flocculates and is removed. So what that means is iron from these lowland uh, wetland dominated rivers is largely removed when it hits the ocean. By contrast, uh, this total dissolvable iron is a measure of the particulate iron. This iron concentration, also quite high, um, shows a different characteristic. It's, it's largely a, a linear behavior between fresh water and saline water. What that means is a lot of the particulate iron in other words, a lot of the particular iron that's coming out from the glacier, this muddy gray stuff, is actually getting mixed out into the ocean without a lot of removal. So that has, that has some big implications, the fact that that fine particulate stuff largely persists into the ocean. Okay, that's a very quick summary of the terrestrial sampling. I'm going to show you some, some uh, summary of the marine sampling that we did on this transect from the Copper River mouth, here is the Copper River. So again, here's Alaska. Here is the mouth of the Copper River. This is the continental shelf break. Our transect extended from the mouth of the Copper River out beyond the continental shelf break. And we sampled on this ship, the RV Montague, based out of Cordova, Alaska. I'm just going to quickly show you some trace metal clean sampling equipment. We used this uh, Teflon, this, this uh, vein that was put in the water. It houses Teflon line tubing. Um, so this thing here is submerged below the water. Uh, there's a pump on the ship that runs all the time and sucks up water from this, this intake through the tubing up through here. Um, comes into this lab. Here's an inside shot of the lab and you see this tubing coming to the lab. This is Andrew Schroth sampling. Essentially while the ship is moving, we can sample trace metal clean uh, water just by turning a tap. Uh, it's pretty cool. So the, the time from sample intake to sample uh, collection is about one minute. So it's quite, quite a quick process. And I'm going to show you some data from that sample collection system, which is necessary, I should point out, to collect uncontaminated samples for iron. One thing about iron is it's easy to uh, easy to contaminate when you're sampling from a big rusty ship because their concentrations are pretty low in the ocean typically. All right, I'm going to, this is some of the motivation for this marine work. This is a, a, an image of chlorophyll. Here's uh, Prince William Sound to, to orient you. Here's the Copper River. Red is high chlorophyll. This is from May of 2009, which is actually a year before our sampling started. But the main point here is that these high plumes of chlorophyll in this coastal region they respond, we think, to high concentrations of nutrients. Um, our sampling was designed to kind of examine some of those nutrient sources and try to understand what's causing uh, this high phytoplankton biomass and, and I should say high productivity as well. Um, one thing that's 
the oceanographers in the crowd will will already know, but I'll mention it to those people who don't, who aren't oceanographers. Um, this process of upwelling is a process by which um, deep water from the ocean um, is uh, driven to the surface, where it can, where the nutrients contained therein can be used by by surface dwelling organisms like phytoplankton. The northern Gulf of Alaska, which I'm, I will refer to periodically as GOA, is a downwelling area. In other words, predominantly downwelling. The water is not the water from the depth is not being raised to the surface. There's actually water from the surface going down. This is a, a NOAA daily upwelling index, which is uh, a function of wind largely. But the point here is that there's downwelling. So you don't have this process by which deep water gets raised to the surface, except except on fairly rare occasion. So what's interesting is despite the fact that this, this area is a downwelling area, you still get high concentrations of nutrients sufficient to drive high productivity in this coastal area. Um, those processes are not that well understood, and that's part of that was part of the motivation for this work. Okay, here are some basic oceanographic observations um, from this coastal Gulf of Alaska area. This is just salinity in the top 40 meters of water. Uh, a lot of information on a slide. This was collected using this device called the Mini-Bat by Rob Campbell of the Prince William Sound Science Center as part of our coastal cruises. This thing kind of flies through the water going up and down to depths of up, up to 30 or 40 meters. And it can essentially map out a, uh, a 2D uh, map of, of parameters that can be measured, in this case salinity. So uh, salinity of zero is fresh water, salinity of 35 is truly seawater. Um, there's a series of time slices here. Uh, what I want to point out is that in, in March, it's, the salinity is pretty boring. It's all fairly uniform at salinity of about 32 or so. Uh, that's because the water column is well mixed. You've got deep winter storms. There's not really any significant river discharge at that time of year. But starting at about in May, you begin to see this uh, yellow and blue region at the very surface. It's a very thin layer, only a few meters uh, deep, and extending um, some, maybe ten, some tens of kilometers offshore. But that is uh, the, the the river plume uh, manifesting itself as freshwater discharge. Remember, there's not much river discharge in the winter, hence you don't see it in the winter. But starting in May and June, you start to see this freshwater plume. And that has big implications for all sorts of things. Okay, one of those things is is iron. Um, in April, which is early in the season, the, again the water column is well mixed. Um, you get these deep storms, and that leads to deep storms lead to churning up of the bottom of sediments. That's visible in the satellite image from above, where you can actually see this murky gray, iron-rich water. Um, in this whole coastal region, this blue line represents the 500 meter contour getting into deep water. But up until that point, pretty much everything is this murky gray. And, and that shows up in our, our iron data. This is um, what we refer, refer to as dissolvable iron. It's uh, the iron that dissolves uh, it from an unfiltered sample at pH 2. I think of it as a measure of the particle concentration of the water. Essentially, across this entire continental shelf region, there's very high concentrations of particulate iron, and then it drops off beyond that. This continental shelf break, shown with this arrow, is a real um, real break point. It's a real point beyond which things things really change. And you see that the iron concentrations drop off dramatically beyond that. Um, green is a measure of the dissolved iron, uh, that which goes through a filter, and that's more what the phytoplankton actually use, but you see that also drops off once you get beyond that continental shelf break. Okay, so in response to all that nitrate, sorry, all that iron, um, the nitrate gets consumed. These are actual depth profiles of nitrate uh, from the same time frame. Um, in green, I'm showing nitrate in April. Nitrate concentrations are pretty boring in April. They're pretty uniform, consistent with that initial slide that I showed you. The, the nitrate profiles are you know, roughly 18 micromolar, which is a high concentration. Um, 
But by July, that nitrate is largely gone in the surface waters. So high nitrate in the spring, by the summertime, that nitrate is gone. That's because um, there's abundant iron, and the iron is sufficient to allow complete drawdown of this, of this nitrate. Now, I want to draw your attention to a couple things, which I'm going to going to help make sense of something in a minute. Note that the nitrate concentration is depleted in the surface waters in these more offshore stations, but there's still plenty of nitrate below a depth of a few tens of meters in this July time frame. That's going to help make some sense of something in a minute. All right, here is a plot of chlorophyll as a function of both time and distance. So this is distance from the coast from 0 to 25 kilometers um, over time from March through August. And um, to take the thing to remember is that blue is low chlorophyll, red is high chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll is an indication of phytoplankton concentration. Again, phytoplankton being the base of the marine food chain. In blue, in early in the season, in March, it's quite boring. There's essentially no chlorophyll. There's no freshwater discharge. Um, there's very little light. Uh, at least not enough light to initiate a bloom. Starting in May, again, remember we got that river discharge. Um, you get riverine input that is um, causing a freshwater lens at the surface um, in response to the freshwater input as well as um, uh, just the increased light levels at that time of year. You see this chlorophyll layer, this, this high chlorophyll layer in other words, the phytoplankton are responding to the nutrients and the light in the surface water. But by, by May 28th, note that the phytoplankton are largely, um, well, the, the concentrations are much lower in this nearshore region in May 28th. But by, by the middle of May, the phytoplankton in this midshore region, at about distance about 10 to 20 kilometers or so, are uh, They've moved deeper in the water column that are about 20 meters. Now, remember, the nitrate was largely consumed uh, by this time. So what the phytoplankton are doing, they're actually moving down in the water column in response to um, the presence of the essential nutrient nitrate down there. And by June, July, August, the phytoplankton concentrations across this whole transect are uh, noticeably lower. Again, this is data. These are data by Rob Campbell from uh, the Prince William Sound Science Center, collected as part of our joint cruises in this region. All right, I want to acknowledge as well the, the extensive work by Laurel McFadden, who was a uh, master student of Rob Campbell at the University of Alaska Anchorage. She did some extensive work on the distribution and ecology of zooplankton and juvenile pelagic fishes in the Copper River Plume. Um, I don't have time to uh, give this work justice, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to acknowledge uh, her extensive work and, and move on from there. Um, I'm going to jump back very quickly to iron. Now, remember the freshwater discharge maxes out in July and August in the Copper River. Now, this is this transect from shore, from the mouth, from the mouth of the Copper River off shore again. Um, what you see is this low salinity water. I'm plotting both iron and salinity on the same plot as a function of distance from shore in July. You see this low salinity water with extremely high concentrations of, 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 of iron. Now that's uh, um, this particulate iron coming in from this massive river discharge that's happening. In fact, if you look closely at this plot, you see that Iron and salinity are, are they co-vary at this time of year. Whenever the salinity is low, the iron is high. Whenever the salinity is high, the iron is low. So what that's telling us is that the the iron at this time of year is coming from this glacial melt water, and it's it's a pretty dramatic effect. Okay, um, just a quick. Uh, mention of an interesting phenomenon of nitrate. Remember, nitrate is the limiting nutrient uh, for phytoplankton in much of this transect. Uh, at this low salinity time of year when the river discharge is at its maximum, 
we see these low salinity surface waters um, in these nearshore stations offshore of the Copper River. We also see nitrate, um, a slight enrichment in nitrate in those surface waters. Remember, this is a time of year when, by and large, the ocean-derived nitrate is consumed. But what we see is that there's uh, nitrate enrichment in this river plume water. It's suggestive, although not entirely convincing, that the river is becoming a source of nitrate at that time of year. So. Uh, there's a couple of possible explanations for that, one of which is that there could be nitrogen-fixing plants that are uh, invading the landscape that are causing this nitrate uh, delivery. There's some other possibilities as well. All right, uh, very briefly, I'm going to quickly mention another mechanism by which iron gets into the Gulf of Alaska and gets transported a long distance. Again, this is the Copper River region. This is um, what we're looking at in this instance is a satellite image of dust. This gray plume that you see, um, now here's a here's the scale for reference, zero to 100 kilometers or so. This gray plume is actually atmospherically, atmospherically transported dust that originates in the Copper River, but also at some other sites along the coastline. Um, this is this image was created um, uh, using the MODIS uh, sensor on on satellites. And um, it's, it's a snapshot in time from November 6, 2006. Uh, but I just want to highlight the location of Middleton Island because we've set up in response to this observation that there are these dust events blowing iron and glacier-derived dust out into the ocean, we've set up um, a, a measurement station out on Middleton Island. Okay, why dust in the autumn? The river levels are low, as I mentioned earlier. There's little or no snow. These exposed sediments, uh, there, there are these abundant exposed sediments that are essentially leftover glacial flour from uh, the, with the weathering that the glacier has achieved all summer long. This is just fine sediment just sitting there. What happens is you get strong winds blowing out of these mountains that uh, resuspend a lot of this material and transport it far offshore. So, I alluded to Middleton Island. Here's a satellite image from November 2011. Um, it's not nearly as dramatic event as the other event I, I showed you, but nonetheless, uh, we have um, aerosol measurements from this time interval, and in fact, you see dust being transported uh, and being captured by our by our uh, sampling system out on Middleton Island uh, at exactly the same time that you see this dust in the air. Uh, this actually was a fairly modest event by the scale of other events that we've seen in the past. Uh, this past year, um, the fall of 2012, we had a much more dramatic event. Um, I don't have the chemistry data to share with you, but we have, we have the samples, and there's a lot of dust on those samples. This is just showing you the sampling equipment. Here's an aerial view of Middleton Island. Uh, this is our uh, aerosol sampler system. Um, I'm going to move forward just because I want to. I want to get to the end here. All right. Um, that's a very, very, very quick overview of some of the sampling. Now I want to give you uh, a sense of some of the modeling that's been done by uh, a group based at the University of Maine. Um, I'm going to show you work uh, for which Yuan Huang is the first author. Um, he was a graduate student of. Dei Chai and Wei Jiezhu at the University of Maine, and, and they, they took an existing Gulf of Alaska uh, model, physical um, model, and added, added Copper River discharge to that model. And what I'm going to show you is the results of that, that work. So again, here's, here's Alaska, here's the Copper River watershed, here's a brief model description. Um, this is what's referred to as a ROMS model, which is ROMS is short for Regional Ocean Modeling System. Uh, it's a three-level, what's referred to as a three-level nested model. In other words, um, there's different regions of the ocean that get higher, get, get um, sampled at higher and higher resolution within the model. There's this coarser re um, resolution region up here, smaller region at finer resolution and high, finest resolution at this uh, um, Copper River mouth 
region. So um, there's resolution, a horizontal resolution of 3.6 kilometers and 40 vertical layers. Now I'm going to show you results from uh, 2010 and 2011, our sampling period. Essentially what these guys have done is created a tool, a modeling tool that can be used to simulate um, the entire Gulf of Alaska and in particular simulate, simulate how it's influenced by discharge from the Copper River. They use realistic model forcing, including um, North American uh, mesoscale model meteorology. They use river discharge from the USGS office in Anchorage, including uh, real-time freshwater uh, observations and nutrient concentrations, specifically nitrate concentrations, based on the river sampling that we did. Now, they used three uh, model cases. I'm going to show you two of those. I'm going to show you um, their model results with typical river discharge and also double discharge. So the double discharge is sort of a um, an example of what would happen in an extreme uh, case of, of, of warming where this, the discharge coming out of the Copper River is greatly increased. That, that is a substantial increase, but um, they did that, I think, largely to uh, uh, just demonstrate what such a substantial increase would cause when you use smaller perturbations, the, the changes are not quite so obvious. Uh, I should say um, right up front, this is definitely their work. I am not uh, a modeler, and so um, I'm doing my best to describe what I can of their model. Um, I, I might have had them uh, present this, but uh, the two lead scientists from this modeling effort are both in China right now. so. Uh, we made a decision that I would present it for them, and I'll do my best. Okay, this is uh, the model topography. Um, again, this is the Copper River. What you see is kind of blocky um, um, land that is what really gets, in, gets simulated in the model. This is Prince William Sound. This is the Copper River. These are our sampling stations over here just off the Copper River. I'm going to show you also data from this mooring in the coastal region off Seward, this GAC-1 location, which GAC is short for Gulf of Alaska-1, um, just to give you, a, just to orient you here. And for those of you who are, are not oceanographers, um, it's well known and has been known for quite a long time. There's a pattern of circulation that's um, well documented for the Gulf of Alaska. You have these coastal currents that um, come along the coastline from the south, and they bend along this northern Gulf of Alaska area to the west, and then they turn back south again. Um, that's well known. You're going to see that show up in the model simulation in just a minute. Right now I'm walking you through some still slides, and I'm going to do a model simulation at the very end just in case there are any hang-ups, so we won't, we won't be delayed by that hang-up in the model. Okay, these are comparisons of the model results with this GAC-1 mooring, this coastal site. Um, the blue data are actual observations, actual measurements of salinity at 20 meters. Um, the red is the model. It's not a perfect match. Uh, you'll see that in the, in the winter, typically, the model salinity is a little bit low. Um, uh, and the timing of these uh, changes is not spot on, but in, in general, it captures the overall flavor of this variability in salinity uh, in response to you know, oceanographic processes. So it does, the model does a pretty good job, although obviously not perfect. Um, this is a simulation of, of temperature. The uh, model does a pretty good job of, of uh, uh, simulating temperature um, a little bit. Temperatures are a little bit cooler in the model uh, at much of the time, but they're, they're pretty close. All right, so what I'm going to show you is the results of um, uh, a tracer experiment where uh, they initiated this model-only tracer. There's, there's essentially discharge happening from the Copper River and coming out of the Copper River. This is just to show where this water from the Copper River goes and what happens to it and what the, what the impacts are of some of that water. This is, not, this is not really salinity. You can think of it as sort of as fresh water. Um, but it's, but it's not really. It's something that you can do in a model. It's a lot harder to do in the real world. They, they essentially created this, uh, this fake parameter that they could trace 
essentially to show where the Copper River discharge goes. That was the whole point of it. Um, and they're going to show, so just to give some background, um, this two times discharge uh, is not completely arbitrary. It's quite a big uh, perturbation. You know, Ed Josberger's work from, um, from the Bering Glacier suggests that if we had substantial warming to the tune of about oh, four or five degrees, um, you would get double the melt discharge, double the summer discharge from the Bering Glacier, just, just to give you a rough idea. All right, so again, I'm going to show you still shots, which are not as instructive as the video, but I'm going to do it just because of there's, a, there's potential that the video is going to um, have problems. But in a nutshell, these are simulations of, um, from July 10th, from both 2010 and 2011. This upper left panel is just the normal discharge with the normal river discharge, and you see this Copper River plume extending out into the ocean with Two times the river discharge, you see quite a large, much larger area impacted by that Copper River plume. 2011, it's a little bit different, um, just because the conditions were a little bit different, but the, the contrast is the same pretty much. The, the region affected by this uh, discharge being doubled is quite a bit larger uh, than in the uh, normal river discharge example. and uh, just to give a, a sense of where this water is going in terms of a mass balance, if you have 100 units of water coming out of the Copper River, uh, the vast majority of it, well, a lot of it is going to be transported, as I mentioned before, to the west. Um, some of it's going to go into Prince William Sound. Some of it's going to come back out of Prince William Sound. Um, almost none of it is going to travel to the east because the prevailing currents are uh, towards the west. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to at the moment is this contrast in what is transported offshore. Um, the red line is the normal river discharge transport. It's only 3.8% of the total, but contrast that with the two times river discharge. If you, have, if you double the, the river discharge, you have a 300% increase in offshore transport. So in other words, it's um, three times as much transport offshore of this river influence water. Um, that's one important difference of this double discharge scenario on the physical circulation. Okay, uh, as a bit of an outreach and part outreach, part science um, effort, Rob Campbell conducted an experiment in collaboration with the native village of EAC. These are, this is a native group in Cordova, Alaska. Again, this is Prince William Sound, this is the Copper River. They released these drifters. These are devices that <coughs> excuse me, essentially float with the water. They did it three times in 2011, in March, May, and July. And then these, these devices have, have GPS on them so they can be tracked and see where they go over time and see where they end up. And what you see is, uh, at all times, these, these, these drifters were transported along the coast and to the west as, you know, as the theory would predict and as the model would predict. Um, some of them went into Prince William Sound, some of them came back out. Um, so the drifter experiment, while, while limited in scope with only three drifters, um, essentially confirms the, the predictions of the model. And, and so it's kind of a nice validation. As I mentioned, it's kind of part outreach, part uh, science experiment, but it's kind of a neat confirmation of what we think we know about circulation in the area. All right, I'm just going to conclude, and then I'm going to come back and show that video. So just to conclude, uh, I hope I convinced you that glaciers are losing mass in the Gulf of Alaska region, as in other regions worldwide. Glacier melt is a source of iron to the coastal Gulf of Alaska region. Uh, there's summertime river discharge um, when much of the fine particulate mass in that river actually gets out of the ocean and escapes, and escapes the estuary, hence that, that glacier-driven discharge is important. In the wintertime, there's um, sediment resuspension from the continental shelf region. Now that still is this fine particulate matter from the glacier, it's just that it's settled out into the sediments, but it gets resuspended every year in the winter. Uh, in autumn, there's dust derived 
from these winds that race down those mountain valleys and transport this fine sediment out from these river valleys hundreds of kilometers out into the ocean. So uh, I want to paint a picture of very seasonally variable sources of iron to this coastal Gulf of Alaska region. Uh, in the winter, there's deep, deep mixing as you get strong storms and limited river discharge. That leads to the water column being very, very mixed, very well mixed and churned up and leads to high concentrations of iron and nitrate in surface waters, which together fuel high spring phytoplankton biomass on the shelf. Um, nitrate is actually the limiting nutrient on our shelf transect. Um, I didn't actually show you, but Laurel's work suggests that zooplankton and, and uh, fish she sampled tend to be more abundant within the river plume than outside the river plume, and that's in response to uh, predator uh, evasion of predators in these turbid river waters. Um, I want to emphasize that melting of glaciers is perturbing these nutrient cycles in ways that we do not fully understand, although there is a suggestion that the rivers uh, are now becoming a summertime source of nitrate. Um, in the winter, the, the, the ocean is that source of nitrate, but that, that nitrate gets used up by massive phytoplankton blooms in the spring, and by the summertime, the river, these glacier-dominated rivers are becoming a source of nitrate um, with a few different possibilities for sources. So impacts of the increased river discharge in response to the increased melt include there's a larger area of Copper River plume. Um, there's increased offshore transport of this river water, which includes particulate iron and, and other species as well. Um, there's most likely increased stratification. In other words, that fresh water layer um, is less dense, and it um, kind of resides on, near the surface, and it reduces vertical mixing, so the deep water can't mix up to the surface, and that probably translates to a reduced nitrate flux to the surface. So some ecosystem responses in response to such a perturbation of increased copper river discharge, these are fairly speculative, and I have to take ownership for this part. It's my speculation. Um, but the ecosystems might, ecosystem responses might include increased productivity beyond the shelf in response to that increased offshore transport of iron and reduce productivity over the shelf in response to that increased stratification that limits nitrate flux to the surface. I just want to mention that uh, impacts on eddies are beyond the scope of this project. So let me, um, I'm going to try to show a video quickly. OK, now should I make this full screen? Yeah. Yes. What I'm going to show you is a video this is a simulation of that discharge from the Copper River to give you a sense of the power of this. This is actually a really nice tool. Um, again, these Gulf, the people from the Gulf of Maine added the Gulf of Alaska, sorry, they added the Copper River discharge to this um, Gulf of Alaska model. And with that, we can now understand the impacts of Copper River discharge on this entire northern Gulf of Alaska region. So just to orient you, this is just discharge from the Copper River, kind of a, a tracer, if you will. It's just Copper River water, not really a salinity. I want to point out the date at the top. It's May 1st, 2010. You'll see the date click along, and you'll see this river water discharge uh, come out uh, through this Copper River mouth in just a second. OK, bear with me. OK, so now you see the dates moving along. You see increased discharge in response to increased melt in the summer and this phenomenon of this water being transported along shore. Now it's July. We're getting close to the period of peak discharge. And you'll begin to see this Copper River water going into Prince William Sound. There you go. Some of it makes its way into Prince William Sound, and it's harder to see it coming out again. But now we're, we're OK, now the discharge is diminishing as summer winds down. It just gives you a feeling for the power of this modeling approach. Now we're into the autumn when there's much less discharge. OK, I think I can stop it there. All right, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>
got through it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, yes, yeah, so if you guys would like to ask a question, um, we do have one question from Gwen, and it says, how bioavailable is the particulate iron from the glacial or the glacier melt waters? Yeah, that's a good question, and I, um, I, uh, I perhaps should have gone into that, but I, I had to gloss over a lot of details. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, the, the most of that is not bioavailable, but the, the thing to keep in mind is that it's a massive, massive quantity, and it just takes a small amount, small amount of dissolution of that massive quantity of particulate iron to translate to a lot of iron imparted to the dissolved phase. Um, and so um, typically, so, so this is a complicated thing to, uh, to quantify, and there's various ways of doing it. Um, uh, but numbers that people throw out there as ballpark uh, estimates of how much of that is available would be something in the range of maybe 2 to 20 percent. The, the literature on this is, is uh, pretty confusing because there are estimates that range from well under 2 to well over 20 percent. Um, in, in a nutshell, the smaller amount of, if you have a small amount of part particulate matter in a large amount of water, you're, you tend to dissolve a higher proportion of, of, of that particulate matter. But, but that, that, anyway, that's a quick answer to that. Does that answer your question? Uh, Gwen says yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. I know that we're running a little bit late, but if there's any last-minute questions, okay, we do have one from Benjamin. And it says, at the beginning of your presentation, I think that you said that the GOA was not a nitrogen-limited nitrogen system. But on the conclusion slide that you said there was a transect was nitrogen limited. Did I see that right? And if so, why the difference? So, um, yeah, perhaps I glossed over that too quickly. Uh, the broader Gulf of Alaska is iron limited, but the coastal region tends to be nitrate limited. Uh, you know. It depends on the time of year and where exactly you're talking about. But um, early in the uh, growing season, uh, it's not limited at all uh, and because there's abundant nitrate and abundant iron. Um, and those tend to be, one of, one of the other tends to be the limiting nutrient. But by the time um, late summer rolls along, or midsummer, uh, in the coastal region, uh, what, I, what I tried to emphasize is that nitrate tends to be fully consumed. Uh, and so nitrate tends to be limiting in that coastal area. Iron is more limiting farther offshore. That's not always the case. There are some coastal areas where that are iron limited, but at least from our data, um, it would appear that um, nitrate is actually the limiting nutrient um, in, the, in the summer in the near shore region. And somewhere out beyond the continental shelf break is where iron limitation kicks in. All right, thank you. We have a question from Tom, and it says, what is the relationship between the Copper River outflow nutrients and the downwelling, upwelling nutrient input? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, again, something I really glossed over, uh, and uh, I have to preface this by saying that m the best answer I could get, the, the the people who could best answer that question would be the uh, the modelers, and that's not me. But um, so, uh, but the Copper River uh, discharge into the ocean um, uh, induces a uh, a process by which, uh, at least, it can induce a process by which you get um, upward mixing of nutrients from below in kind of an estuary and circulation where you get outflow at the surface of this fresh water, and that um, induces entrainment of water below that that causes a return flow of and, and kind of an upwelling. Um, so you, the, the presence of the river itself can induce this upward, um, sort of an upwelling in the, 
toxicity of the, of the river plume. That's one reason that river plumes can be fairly productive because you have all this mixing going on of, of deeper water being raised to the surface. That's kind of a process that's somewhat independent of this downwelling, upwelling uh, phenomenon. The, the, the upwelling index that I showed, which, which tended to show primarily downwelling, um, is um, that, that's more uh, relevant to regions outside of a, the influence of the river where the prevailing winds are largely what, what drives drives that. So uh, the winds are such that uh, you tend to get downwelling, um, except in fairly rare occasions in that part of the world. Uh, does that, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's, that's one, one attempt. And then Tom, if you just want to chat yes or no, that would be great. Um, he said yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one more question from Patricia, and it says, have you looked at how productivity varies with PDO or other climate variation? Or put another way, do the local factors you discuss dominate productivity shifts, or do other factors like PDO dominate productivity at certain times or phases? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, let's see. The, 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 I, it's hard for me to give a short answer to that question, but um, it, different people define productivity in different ways. Often people um, use the satellite image of chlorophyll to say something about productivity, and that's, that's chlorophyll was pretty much the only thing I showed in this presentation. But, but that really is a measure of algal or phytoplankton biomass, whereas productivity is, is a rate that isn't really um, measured by that um, chlorophyll concentration. To get at um, productivity requires, well, there's a, a whole bunch of different methods that people use. Um, the, the classical way is to, is to incubate samples in a bottle, radiocarbon labeling. Paul Quay here at University of Washington is, is uh, one of the people who's um, come up with a very elegant way uh, using dissolved gas measurements to get at this rate of uh, uh, carbon uptake or, or oxygen production. Um, in a nutshell, you get different answers depending on how you measure it. Uh, you know, the bottle method I mentioned um, is, gives an instantaneous snapshot, plus there are sometimes bottle effects. Uh, there, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to waffle, I'm trying to just say there, there really aren't sufficient observations um, with enough different techniques to answer that question because you get variation by, you get the, the different methods disagree by um, many times depending on, you know, by two to eight times uh, when you intercompare them. So there, there really needs to be more in your comparison, these various methods of inferring biological productivity. Um, has, hasn't been a lot of that, and so um, until there's a kind of a rigorous inner comparison, um, I don't think, I don't feel like I can answer that question. Um, no doubt, broad scale oceanographic processes, um, you know, such as the, the PDO, which, which by the way stands for Pacific Decadal Oscillation, for those who don't know that term, um, they are going to have a big influence on biological processes in the broad Gulf of Alaska. I was, our work was focused more on this coastal region offshore of the Copper River, which um, is heavily influenced by the processes in the Gulf of Alaska, but it's, it's kind of its own beast in a way too, just because of the tremendous amount of freshwater discharge coming out there, um, which influences nutrients, nutrients and uh, stratification. All right, I'm just uh, scanning for any additional questions. I am Patricia said, thank you very much. Um, we do have another one from Kay, and it says, how might ocean acidification affect the, I think iron um, 
concentration in the model, if at all, um, FE? Yeah, uh, another very good question. Um, uh, the, the first primary thing I have to say is that I don't think we we know again because of not insufficient observations. But you know, your first instinct is that um, ocean acidification would lead to um, greater iron concentrations. I mean, the, the the solubility of iron is a function of pH. You now, ocean acidification is a pretty small perturbation. Um, of pH, but uh, you know when the ocean gets more acidic, there's going to tend to be a little bit more solubility of iron. So if anything, you know acidification in and of itself is probably going to cause um, slight increase in iron concentration. Uh, having said that, um, uh, it's probably likely that ocean acidification is going to have much so many other um, impacts that that. Ph effect in by itself is is going to well I, I I'm this is my own gut feeling it's going to be um, dominated by other things that are going to also affect the iron concentration but um it just pH alone is going to increase the iron solubility in iron concentration. All right, thank you, John. And I'm not seeing any more questions. And Kay says, thank you very much, John. <clears throat> All right. I'd like to thank John for an excellent presentation that was very informative.